Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here with day two of our campaign diaries. This is a recap for both students who, due to the coronavirus pandemic, may not be able to attend any given course session, as well as for friends and well-wishers who are interested in how this class is structured and run. Um, you all are welcome. I'm gonna walk through our first really full day of class. It's day two, it's Thursday. Um, this is a 75 minute class. And so we dug into our most challenging, at least in terms of length, um, reading for the semester. Um, so we, I kind of threw our students who are mostly seniors kind of off the deep end to see how they'd swim when confronted with 51 pages from role-playing game studies, colon, transmedia foundations. Um, edited by Dieterding and Zagal. And we read specifically Dieterding's and Zagal's uh, sections on the many faces of role-playing game studies, which is a kind of overview of the history of how the topic has been studied, as well as definitions of role-playing games, which students found incredibly useful for its kind of walkthrough in a textual form of the different fo forms that role-playing games take, be it live action role-playing games or LARPs, tabletop role-playing games or TRPGs or TTRPGs, um, computer RPGs or CRPGs, as well as massive multiplayer online role-playing games or MMORPGs. Students had some familiarity with maybe one of or more of those depending. Um, but one of the things that we found out in the course of our discussion today is, of course, something that I already knew, but that they now disclose to each other, which is we've got some folks who are active role players and indeed dungeon masters and storytellers. We've got some folks, uh, although not as many as you might think if you're in the tabletop community, a few who come to uh, their interest in role playing games through stuff like the Adventure Zone, um, actual play podcasts and streams. Um, and then a whole bunch of folks who are totally new to the hobby who are taking this class because it fulfills different kinds of requirements in our, you know, collective uh, course uh, and uh, major and whatnot design. So that was one of the things that we talked about today, um, using an exercise inspired by the work of uh, Eugenia Zurofsky, um, an exercise she calls, Where Do You Know From?, and the idea behind the exercise is to articulate and think about um, the different elements of knowledge and knowledges that you're bringing into any given space. And that makes room both for academic ways of knowing, and we've got lots of different uh, ways of knowing in that way. I talked a little bit that, about that in the first video on all the different majors that we have, but also this is a class that's building on a lot of expertise that's not normally incorporated into the kind of scholarly architecture, at least here at Auburn. And so that was when we found out who had, you know, DMing experience, who had some, you know, kind of game experience, those sorts of things. So I had students, instead of doing this as a kind of completely solitary exercise or as a self-introduction, we did this at our small tables, kind of groups of anywhere from three to five or six folks. Um, and we're gonna continue to kind of get to know each other, right? This is, we're still in early days and role-playing games require a lot of trust. And uh, so we got all on the same page today in terms of some terminology and some concepts using this really big, dense reading. I've been very pleased with how people are responding on perusal. So if you're wondering what do good perusal annotations look like, the ones that you're doing right now. I've responded to a lot of questions there. And a lot of amazing high-level questions are coming from our new colleagues who have not uh, thought about role-playing games before. Things like, what makes for a good dungeon master? What makes for a satisfying experience? How long do you have to take to play a game? How many rules do you need? What are the rules? And the answer, of course, to all of those things is, it depends. And a lot of it, as I was trying to talk about today, is about what we agree to at the table. And so that was one of the reasons why the first activity that we did in class today was play a game, this beautiful game. 
Um, this is uh, Alex Roberts's For the Queen, a story building card game. Um, it's I knew I was on the right track. Well, I knew I was on the right track anyway, because I love this game and I think it's amazing and beautiful. And it's been great fun for me to play with my own groups of nerds of varying levels of engagement with role-playing games. But when Evan Turner on Twitter like, was like, this is a great way to start, I knew I was really excited. Um, I've uh, been prepping for class by watching um, James Intercosto's um, amazing uh, podcast, which I've been a long time fan of, um, One Shot. Um, One Shot allows you to kind of sample the experience of playing lots of different games that maybe you um, don't know them. You know, some, some, some of us learn by reading a rule set and some of us learn by watching or listening to other people play through. Um, I'm certainly much more of the latter and I found it really useful to kind of come back to the two different playthroughs that One Shot actually has done. Once with Alex as designer and another one with Patrick Rothfuss, which was a kind of um, one, uh, you know, a two-hander as we might say. Um, both are, re are linked on Canvas uh, for those who are interested and I'll uh, link them uh, in the description to this video for folks who are not, you know, in my class. What I love about For the Queen is that it's a GM-less system, so no one had to take on the role of being in charge. There's no prep, um, and it plays really quickly. Um, the instructions are on cards, and the table goes around and reads them as they do the tasks of preparing for the setup of the game. I actually set up each of these. I did four of them for four tables. Um, I actually set them up before class because what I wanted to make sure was that the games were the same length. So the way that For the Queen becomes a game that you can play in a half an hour or extend to even a two hour game is that uh, you're reading story prompts off of cards one player at a time until you hit the card that says the queen is under attack and then everyone has to respond about whether they defend the queen or not based on the answers about character that they have generated across the time that they've been playing. So character creation is, is a process of answering these questions. Um, so what I did in order to ensure, because I wasn't sure how long this was going to take, um, I counted 15 cards and then I slipped the queen is under attack card in. So every table had exactly 15 cards to play through and then be done. I set a timer for half an hour and didn't know whether we were going to go over that half an hour or whether we we're going to go under. We went under by a lot. Everyone was done and some uh, tables had long been done by the time we got to about 18 minutes. So if you're also looking for like a taster game that plays really quickly, this is fabulous. What I found most fascinating is that at least one, if not two of the tables continued to play the game after the queen is under attack. Uh, and so kind of continued the narrative after the, the attack on the queen, which I don't think is something that Alex intended. I don't know how often that happens. I'd be very curious um, if you know of games of For the Queen that continue after that prompt. Let me know. What is it like? What does it do? But already we're seeing student uh, tinkering with the bounds of the game, which I love. Um, I asked students on Mentimeter, which is a kind of textual based, you know, they can answer with their phones sort of way to kind of freeform react and tell us a little bit about the story that they told. And so I heard everything from my queen was evil to my queen made me drink gasoline to all kinds of fascinating things. Um, you know, at one point I heard somebody say, wait, is our queen married? They just said it really loud. Um, you know, it was fabulous. Um, so this was and so then we did the kind of breakdown of what is this game like what was the feeling like are you know you know what is role playing like for you now that you're having this first initial taste um and so that led into um some really good discussion um that i think will continue um the other reason why i really love um starting with this game on the first on the kind of the second day first kind of serious day of class is because of this beautiful card right here which is the x card um the x card is a very minimal but important safety tool um and this was also a day where since we're talking about you know so much of 
fun at the table, meaning at the table, and safety at the table is based on kind of us sitting down and talking about expectations. Um, the X card allows for, you know, you tap, you, you can tap the X card if you want something to be removed from discussion. But that's, of course, one part of an enormous sweep of safety tools that are available. And so that was when I then pointed students to the work of uh, Kiana Shaw and Lauren Bryant Monk uh, with their TTRPG Safety Toolkit, which is a suite of safety tools that they've curated and made publicly available. It's an amazing resource. And I think it's been really transformative for game design. Most games that I encounter now will make reference to the safety toolkit or elements of the safety toolkit. And of course, you know, as we'll talk about when we talk about streaming, uh, streamers often make reference to use of safety tools as well. And when they don't and they're, and something goes buoy, it can be really controversial. Um, one of the things I most appreciate about B. Dave Walters DMing for the Black Dice Society is that he says at the very beginning, but with a content warning for his audience, this is a horror uh, game that's set in Ravenloft. It may include content that you might not expect normally from a Dungeons and Dragons game, um, but also a kind of acknowledgement that before the cameras went on and in kind of somewhat private spaces of the player chat, uh, with the DM, there's, you know, lines and veils have already been discussed. Um, and there's a, there's a mechanism that has been set in place. We don't know specifically what it is, but presumably it's something that involves chat, um, private chat, uh, that will allow us to pivot so that the audience is told also the story may change abruptly at some point if a player is not comfortable. Those are all really important signals. This is not the first time that my students are being initiated into the notions of stars and wishes, lines and veils, uh, and questions of content warning. They got that the very first email they were uh, receiving from me last spring after they enrolled in the class. I sent out a pretty elaborate survey to students asking about their preparation for the course, um, what they were excited about, what they were, I mean, this is really important in um, a pandemic so that you know where your students are. Um, kind of emotionally, although I think we were in a different kind of headspace um, at, in the spring than we are now. So in retrospect, maybe I should have held off on the survey, but that's, you know. But the other thing that I asked was kind of lines and veils, stars and wishes. And I used that language and made reference to the safety toolkit at that very early moment to kind of show this class is being run to the extent possible on the same principles and ethos of the safety toolkit. Students may not be able to X out on content, however. As I also said in class today, one of the important things that we have to remember is that we cannot shy away from the part, the ugly parts of role playing's history. Um, this is a hobby that has some connections uh, to um, notions of white supremacy. Um, the hobby has an ugly history in terms of um, how it how it has related to women and sexual minorities there's still a whole lot of fuckery in terms of the representation of different peoples um that you know doesn't always get resolved before things get published um and and moreover so in addition to kind of like harmful stuff right like in the history that we need to understand the history in order to try to do better um there's also going to be potentially disturbing content in games that we play because some of the most you know kind of ambitious games that we have going today and the most interesting games are also ones that are trying to tackle real human challenges and so you know We've got games that try to dramatize or engage with issues around mental health, um, around a violence in different in, in kind of ways that don't feel fantasy but feel visceral. Um, so while some of the reading discussed, you know, the possible kind of escapist or fantastic elements of role playing games, one of the things I said explicitly in class today is. Don't forget this is a medium that has lots of different ways in, is being used in lots of different creative ways, and some of those are going to be disturbing. Um, and that's actually often where the interesting stuff is. So we kind of can't kind of escape it. 
um, but I will do my best to kind of alert students and in some cases provide alternative uh, kind of ways forward where that's that's possible. Much of what I'm going to be doing in terms of content warning is a forewarned is forearmed sort of thing. So what I'm trying to paint the picture of here is the idea that we kind of ended a week of what I like to think of as session zero. This is the, we're, we're starting to create the terms of engagement um, for how we're going to relate to one another. Um, it's not per a perfect, uh, you know, it's to call me the game master, I think is a little bit of a challenge um, because that works in some ways and doesn't in others, right? Like there's more power in my position than in a DM, I think in a lot of ways, but I think I'm also drawing a lot on my DMing and storytelling experience as I think about the you know ways, ways this class works. And certainly as I've tried to articulate and I'll articulate more as we move uh, into things like the grading contracts, which there's a video about that if you're curious, um, is decentering myself. Certainly if if the goal of the game master is to be every like NPC, monster, etc. Like that is a pretty good description of what a, a, a professor and at least this professor is sometimes like. I don't intend to be monstrous, but you know, I am not responsible for the image that my students have in their heads of who I am. So, so that's where we ended. And it was such a great class. Um, this class is energizing every time. It makes me so pleased. We had some after class discussion. So for those of you who are a little bit more experienced with role playing games, this was a fairly elementary sort of uh, week of information. It was very dense and it was kind of translating it into academic language, but a lot of it would have been familiar to folks who already have experience with role playing games, although it might kind of frame it slightly differently. As we're going to move forward, especially as we think about, um, you know, week two and week three, week two as how, how do different people write about games, um, and week three where we talk about what is Dungeons and Dragons, not just like what is Dungeons and Dragons, but like what is Dungeons and Dragons and what is it becoming, um, which is a question that none of us have the answer to, so we're all going to struggle bus. Um, but first, it's my birthday on Tuesday. It's my 40th birthday, God help us all. And so I have been a little bit self-indulgent and I am assigning um, two pieces of my writing, one of which appears in here, um, role-playing games in the digital age, essays on transmedia storytelling, tabletop RPGs and fandom, which is an amazing collection. Um, and not just because I have an essay on critical role in here, but because there's a lot of interesting meditations on the Avenger Zone about the effect of live streaming more generally. It's just a really rich resource at a, for academic publishing, I just would just like to note a pretty affor affordable price. If you're interested in seeing a preprint of my essay in particular, I am happy to do that by email. You can find my email. My students, of course, will have a, a copy of this in perusal for them to annotate. So they're going to have an example of academic writing uh, that I've done about uh, narrative time and critical role, uh, which is a piece that I know teaches well because it was already assigned in Germany this summer for a similar kind of course, which is a great honor. Um, so I'm hoping it explains critical role to the majority of the class who are not critters. And luckily there's me and some other classmates who will fill in the gaps um, and possibly some other folks later in the semester. Um, the other piece of writing that I am including on Tuesday uh, of my own is an essay that I actually have in progress that's designed for a kind of more public facing non-academic audience. So we're going to see how I kind of translate the ideas from this kind of heavy citation academic piece, admittedly trying to be a clear writer, but much more kind of footnotey to a kind of public facing piece that I'm still workshopping and, and sending around. So if you're interested in an essay on critical role for your publication, um, that piece is a close reading in turn, at least in part, of a video you can find on YouTube, and I'll put the link uh, in the description, 
of uh, Matt Coville uh, of Running the Game fame, uh, much uh, bigger presence on YouTube than than me. Um, long may he reign. Um, but his um, his uh, discussion of the climax of Critical Role Campaign One um, and the ways in which he walks his readers or viewers through um, that the the kind of importance of a particular scene um, an importance that's not immediately visible which is quite lovely um, so he's doing a very interesting video essay so we're going to look at that as well in part because I, I I talk about it in my essay but in part because it's a really interesting video essay close reading um, and I think that pointing students who are asking questions about what makes a good DM to people like Matt Coville is a good thing he is a river to his people so that's what's coming up in uh, the not too distant future. Um, and uh, we will then have my good friend, uh, Mix Tiffany Lee, uh, come on Thursday of next week to talk about uh, reviewing uh, role playing games. And so there, we're going to be reading two reviews that they've created, um, one of which was for a campaign that I actually played in um, with, uh, with Tiffany Lee which is Brindlewood Bay. Uh, so uh, stay tuned if you really love um, the Golden Girls or 80s and 90s detective shows like and Murder, She Wrote and think that they would be vastly improved by a touch of eldritch horror uh, in the kind of Cthulhu form. Brindlewood Bay is your game. It is amazing. It is lovely. It is super fun. And so we're going to take a look at the rules for that and talk about our campaign. Um, when Tiffany is able to join us, she's the f they're the first of our um, kind of virtual visits, of which we're going to have uh, several more before the end of term. Um, some of those are kind of in process in part because, as you'll know if you watch the first video, um, the middle of the semester is kind of wide open and it's really dependent on student interest. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, we will kind of have some uh, some consensus about where we want to go and who we might want to talk to and and what are what's the preparation work that we want to do in order to be ready to talk to those folks. I've been so excited to hear from creators, game developers, performers who are interested in coming and talking to us and that's just such a thrill and as an 18th centuryist if the objects of my normal study uh, wanted to come and talk they'd be zombies so I'm really glad that there are living people and not zombies who want to come and talk to my students um, although zombie mm -hmm. Fanny Bernie would be really cool I digress I am punch drunk in delight with um, my students um, with the feedback that folks are giving about the course um, and just the act of sharing something that I love so very much and am actively kind of trying to wrestle and learn more about myself. Um, so uh, if you have questions, as always, uh, you, my students can bring them to class, put them on perusal, put them in our class discord. Um, all of those are splendid. Um, for those of you who are beyond our university context, you can always tweet at me at Fried, F-R-I-E-D-E, -E, um, or you can drop a comment below um, and we'll see you next week. If I say see you next Tuesday, that'd be awkward. Okay, <laughs> bye guys. Have a great weekend.